Hello and welcome to Northampton Methodist Church's Worship at Home. It's great you're able to join us and I'm glad to be sharing the word today. If you want to contact us then all the details are on the website where you'll also find other worship resources, other messages and services and uh, yeah, family all age worship activities too. This time we're looking at Matthew 22 and another situation where the religious leaders are trying to trap Jesus so that they can arrest him. It begins at verse 34. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. They thought it was a pretty good question. What's the greatest commandment in the law? There are so many to choose from. That should get him in a tangle for a while. In response, Jesus announced, The greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength, and love your neighbour as yourself. In Luke's Gospel, Jesus elaborates about the most famous commandment with probably the most famous parable about who is our neighbour. And we all know the truth of that story. But what about the part Jesus identified first of all? our wholehearted love for God. Our wholehearted love for the whole of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Father, Creator, yes. Jesus, Son, Saviour, yes. Holy Spirit, Comforter, Counselor, Lord, Giver of Life. Um, well, not quite so sure. Maybe it's a throwback to the charismatic movement of the 70s. I, I don't know. But it seems to me that there exists an attitude that has become part of a kind of unofficial creed that we don't do that sort of thing in Methodism. It carries the implication that it's unthinking, only interested in feelings and, and getting a buzz, overly demonstrative and generally not as good, more shallow in faith, basically to be avoided. You know the sort of thing. A common shorthand used is, we're not happy clappy here. Come on. Own up if you've said that. Maybe you didn't realise that is just as prejudice as being racist or being sexist to some of us. In the early days of Methodism, they, call, they called such people enthusiasts. And it was the Methodists that they were accusing of being enthusiasts. What's happened? Now, when they asked him a challenging question, 
Jesus' approach was quite often to respond with a challenging question in reply. So I'm going to take a leaf out of his book and bring a challenging question too. When was the last time you heard a full-on sermon on the theme of the Holy Spirit? Maybe it was last Pentecost. When did you last ask for more of God's Holy Spirit in your personal prayer? How often do we talk about the Holy Spirit in church, let alone in our conversation? What's your reaction now as I'm talking about the Holy Spirit? How do you feel? OK, so that's more than one question already. But I do wonder why there is so much hesitation, awkwardness and straight out fear about being open to the Holy Spirit. He is, after all, the third person of the Trinity, a full equal member of the Godhead, exactly like the Father and Jesus. Have we really forgotten the Nicene Creed that states we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified? Ask yourself, how are we doing with the worshipping and glorifying of the Holy Spirit in the same way as we do God the Father? Wholeheartedly loving God, the Holy Spirit. Have we forgotten that the Holy Spirit is as much a person of the Trinity as the Father and the Son? For example, look at Genesis 1 and see that it is the Holy Spirit who broods creatively over the waters. Without the Spirit, there's no life in creation or breathed into the first humans. In John 14, Jesus promises another advocate referring to the Holy Spirit, exactly the same as him. And in Acts 1.8, Jesus tells his disciples to wait for the Spirit to come to fill the church with life and power to drive their witness, their ability to effectively share the good news of Jesus with the world. If you look at John 16 verse 8, you'll see that it's the Holy Spirit who leads the church in bringing people to faith, a conviction of their need of Jesus' death for their sin. And that just wasn't a once-off at Pentecost either. It's the evangelistic process of God, as Jesus told Nicodemus, that they must be born of water and of the Spirit, born anew into a living relationship with the living God by the life of his Holy Spirit in them. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, if we'd rather not be open and receptive to the Holy Spirit, then we're missing out. Missing out on the life and power that he brings both to individuals and to the church. And without the life of the Holy Spirit, we as the church cannot play our part in helping new people come to faith and hopefully become part of the church. If the church is not open to the life-giving Holy Spirit, then it has no life at all, and that branch of the church shrivels and dies. If we'd rather not be open and receptive to the Holy Spirit, we are effectively asking God not to be supernatural. It's like asking me to come into church but to leave my right arm and my left leg outside. It's impossible. In our desire to be disciplined and reasonable and self-controlled, I can't help wonder if we've left no room for the Holy Spirit at all, to bring us something that we hadn't thought of, to touch hearts and lives with the love and healing and forgiveness that God longs to bring to us as his children. To quote a common expression, have we thrown the baby out with the bathwater? <laughs> and possibly the bath as well. 
So when you hear the greatest commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind and strength, remember Jesus means all of God too. So let us seek to equally include the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life in our daily prayer and corporate worship and truly love God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit with all our heart and mind and strength. Let's pray. Loving God, we confess to you that uh, it's so difficult to know you in all your great wonder and glory and for us as mere mortals to understand the full wonder and pure love of the Trinity. Loving God, fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, with a desire to love you with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. Fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, that we might live for you and join you in bringing new people into your kingdom. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we might be full of your life and full of your love. For we know that we love because you first loved us. Help us to experience your love. So experience your love that it overflows from us and we cannot help but share it with others. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Heavenly Father. Lord Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen.